Those are great jellies, yeah. I was about to say, those jellies are really cool. <laughs> oh, mine. <laughs> it's I need a, to spice up my background here. Uh, it's a shower curtain that we have not been using, and when I had to start working from home, my husband was really excited to turn our basement into an office space for me. With Behind there is hiding a wardrobe and some old books. <laughs> yeah, I've gotten spoiled by my Zoom go. background. Tune in live. Welcome and thank you for joining us for Mesa Week. This is our first day of Mesa Week, so we're so excited that you're here to learn about the theme of healthcare. Uh, this session is called OMSI STEM, STEM Spark. Uh, we're going to learn about viruses with our uh, guest speakers today. Uh, we're so happy that you've been able to join us for, for this conversation. Uh, my name is Josh. I've been the Mesa host for all of today's activities. We're going to start this session with a brief introduction from our speakers and then follow up with a Q&A and answer some audience questions uh, via our moderator. Uh, for those of you who attended earlier sessions today, whether our college hangouts or career insights, welcome back. We're glad that you're still here. Uh, for those of you who are new to Big Marker, we've got a couple of housekeeping items. Please bear with me. Uh, we've turned off video features to protect your privacy. However, you can send us questions through the Q&A tab to the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we won't be able to get to every question, so please do upvote your favorite questions. That helps us prioritize the questions that are most interesting to you as an audience. Please be mindful of our privacy policy our, uh, on our homepage, and don't post anything inappropriate or you will be removed from the session. Throughout the session, please post your questions in the Q&A tab, uh, and we'll ask them at the end. Do tag us in photos and videos using our handle at Oregon Mesa or on Facebook. At the end of the week, we'll share our favorite photos and videos during the awards ceremony. Tune in at 3 p.m. on Thursday for that awards ceremony. And seniors, please be sure to join us at 2 p.m. on Thursday for a special graduation ceremony. Stick around until the end of this presentation to be entered to win a Smart Circuits Games and Gadgets Electronics Lab. We'll be announcing the winners of uh, this session on Thursday during that end of week ceremony. Now I'm pleased to kick it over to our moderator, Ebeth. Ebeth, take it away. Hi, thanks, Josh. Uh, I'm gonna skip us forward here a bit. Uh, so like Josh had my, said, my name is uh, Elizabeth Andenen. I work for OMSI, the Oregon Museum of Science and Industry down in Portland, Oregon. Uh, and today I have Dr. Ken Stedman joining me. Dr. Stedman is a professor of biology at Portland State University and a founding member of PSU's Center for Life in Extreme Environments. Ah, doesn't that sound awesome? Uh, I recently had the opportunity to watch Dr. Stedman do a presentation about viruses from one of OMSI's virtual science pubs, and it was really fascinating to learn about viruses and how they mutate, and I'm really excited for what he's going to present today. Uh, I also really enjoy what he wrote in his bio for Mesa Week. Uh, he wrote, Ken Stedman and his team find viruses in the strangest places. In doing so, they've also discovered new clues about how life evolved. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Stedman. Welcome. Thank you, Beth, and thanks to everybody um, watching at home or wherever it happens to be that you're watching right now. Uh, basically, what I wanted to do was to start out with a little video, which I made. Um, uh, you'll be able to tell at the end how long ago it was that this video was made, um, and tells you a little bit about some of the stuff that we do and leads, I think, quite nicely into my sort of general virus presentation um, a little bit later on. So um, Adam, why don't you go ahead and roll the video?
if there's a way to click through that. If not, it's not a huge deal. The reason that NASA should be really interested in viruses is that, at least on this planet, there are more viruses, 10 to 100 times more viruses than there are of anything else which is around. The question really is, is what about humans in terms of, are humans viruses? Lots of viruses that we know of actually change their environment, change their host in particular. And my favorite example is actually those viruses that infect some of the algae and the bacteria in the oceans that make the oxygen we breathe. But you think about it from the human Earth perspective. Humans have clearly changed what's going on on Earth and changed it in such a way that it may actually be beneficial for the Earth and certainly beneficial for humans. And so you can think about all kinds of things that have happened on our planet which may actually be positive from an Earth point of view. Hi, I'm Dr. Ken Stedman from Portland State University, the Center for Life and Extreme Environments. So, uh, sorry about the little technical glitch there as far as showing the video um, a couple of times, but <clears throat> first, um, a little slightly embarrassing, yes, coming soon in 2012. Um, that was about eight years ago. Um, it's also not been updated. I'm sure if we were to do this trailer again, we would end up having something about, well, you all know about the coronavirus. And so um, that process. But I think before I get started with my presentation, I just wanted to do a quick poll to hear, or I should say probably read, more about what you are interested in me talking about. So please go ahead and vote on some of these things. Looks like I got to vote too.
Okay, thanks for your um, votes there. It looks as if most people are interested in virus evolution, um, quite a few on coronaviruses, and to some extent what we're doing with virus structure in my research work. So I'm gonna tailor my presentation kind of based around some of those themes and really concentrate on the virus evolution thing, which is great because virus evolution is something that I'm really excited about. So why don't I go ahead and get started with my PowerPoint here. Um, this is, see, screen, we'll do screen two, share this, it's got all the polls on it, and we can start the PowerPoint. So, oops, got a little ahead of ourselves here. So yeah, um, as we've heard already, um, Ken Stedman, Center for Life and Extreme Environments, um, also in the biology department at Port and State University. I'm gonna switch this over to a blue laser pointer because I like that one a little bit better, if it's actually going to do it. Um, laser pointer. We'll do actually a red laser pointer here. Uh, a lot of the stuff that I'm gonna talk about is outlined on my website. I'm here, extremeviruses.org. This is something that one of my undergraduate students put together um, recently. It's a really nice website, much better than one that I could do, and it's more or less up to date. If you wanna be more up to date, um, you can follow what I'm doing on Twitter. Um, I'm an extreme virus prof. Um, the title, um, Mesa came up with that one. The title that I usually use is actually one that one of my colleagues from US News and World Report first came up with, Viruses from Hell. Um, and this is because some of the places that we sample from and you saw in the video are places called things like Bumpus Hell and Devil's Kitchen. And so that's what people think about with the viruses that we specifically work with in my lab. But then I wrote a paper a couple of years ago and it ended up in the press as being killer alien viruses. And so you know, alien space viruses, which could wipe out humanity, may be terrifyingly common. Um, bear in mind, this was from a little over two years ago. Um, some people are saying that the new coronavirus has come from space that's complete and utter garbage, as is also um, this title. Um, this, you know, metro.co.uk is sort of the definition, I would say, of really bad news. I'm not going to call it fake because I don't like to use that. Of course, everyone's interested, and many of you are probably interested in viruses now because of this one. And I will spend some time talking about this, and I'm happy to answer questions a little bit later on. Um, but the main thing I wanted to talk about right now, and this has become even more critical in the days of COVID-19, is that viruses have actually a really bad rap. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about why I study viruses, and it actually has nothing to do with why viruses make people sick. It's much more about the sort of fundamental nature of viruses. And before we talk about that, I need to sort of give you some definitions of viruses and kind of walk you through what I call the virus life cycle. So, in a virus life cycle, this is shown here for a virus that infects bacteria, but this is really true for pretty much any kind of virus, is you have an extracellular form, which is what most people talk about in terms of a virus, but this is really what we call a virion. So this virion binds to the outside of a cell. Again, this is a bacterial cell here, but the same thing is true for all other viruses. They bind to the outside of the cell, this virion does, and then the genome, the nucleic acid, or the instruction manual for the virus gets injected inside the cell, and then this instruction manual reprograms the cell in order to get the cell to make a lot more of the instruction manual, and then all of the pieces that come together to make this extracellular particle, or again, virion, before it can go and infect a new uninfected cell. Now, in this process, very often these cells die. And that's why most people, when they think about viruses, like Sir Peter Medawar, say things like, 
A virus is a piece of bad news wrapped up in a protein or wrapped up in a protein coat because usually these are made up of proteins. Sometimes they have some lipids on the outside as well. If you look at most textbooks, they actually don't quite cite the same way. They call it a very small infectious obligate intracellular, excuse me, a very small infectious obligate intracellular parasite. Um, and this is in generally pretty good, you know, very small, infectious. It's got to get inside another cell. Whether it's a parasite, I think, is a bit of an open question. I like to think of these as more symbionts. Sometimes they can be parasitic, sometimes they can be mutualistic. And then my previous definition, which is a little on the oversimplified side, is a bag of nucleic acid because that instruction manual is inside the virion. And then as soon as it gets inside the cell, then it makes more of that particular instruction manual. And so yeah, this was my definition. Turns out I actually found a much nicer definition um, from Salvador Luria, which says viruses are entities whose genomes are elements of nucleic acid that replicate inside living cells using the cellular synthetic machinery and causing the synthesis of specialized elements. Now these specialized elements, remember that's this extracellular part of the virus that can transfer the viral genome, the instruction manual, to other cells. And there are a couple of things that I really like about this definition. It doesn't say that what's on the outside of the cell is the virus. It talks about this whole process as being the virus, which includes this extracellular particle, which again, as I mentioned, is a virion. So now we'll switch over to what one of my good colleagues, Patrick Fortier in France says, which is, ceci n'est pas un virus. Now we'll do a quick poll to see how many of you know why, or what I should say, the relationship of this quote is to something else. So please bring up the next poll. Great, so about half of you think it's a statement by Emmanuel Macron, um, the French president, and then um, a third a painting by the surrealist uh, Belgian painter, Mike, René Magritte. Actually, it is that first one, um, and I cannot claim the connection to this. Um, it was really, again, my colleague, um, Patrick Fortier, who um, came up with this particular um, quote, again, it being, um, ceci n'est pas un pipe, which is that this is not a pipe with a painting of a pipe. And so the idea here with this particular image, um, which is the one we can show here, um, ceci n'est pas un virus, um, ceci n'est pas un viri a virus, is that it's not the virus itself. This is just the virion. This is just on what's on the outside of the cell. So if you get nothing else from this presentation, it's that you know what you see on the outside of the cell is only part of the whole story. So let me just switch gears a little bit. Why do I study viruses? Um, I don't study viruses because they make people sick. I study viruses because they're really everywhere. They infect everything, all kinds of living organisms, all living cells. They're incredibly diverse. And particularly important for me, viruses are great tools for understanding what they infect. And yes, they make people sick, 
And these are my two favorite viral vectors here, uh, my two daughters a few years ago now. Now, viruses, most people define viruses as bad because they were originally identified as causing disease. A little over 100 years ago, a Dutch scientist and a Russian scientist found that there was something that made tomato plants, and actually tobacco plants originally, but also for tomato plants, made them sick. And that was due to something that wasn't a bacteria. It was too small. And because of that, they called it this, you know, slimy liquid or poison or venom. But that was, again, about 100 years ago. And since then, most people have studied viruses that make people sick. People knew about viruses that made people sick or actually knew about viral disease literally thousands of years ago. Um, this is from about 5,000 years ago. And this poor guy almost obviously or almost definitely had polio because of this, you know, really withered one of his two legs. But I'm particularly interested in viruses because they are everywhere, absolutely everywhere. Hey, and Ted, what, really quickly, I'm sorry, we're not seeing your slides. Can you go back to screen sharing? Oh, no, did I not screen share? I thought that I had. You were sorry, for I the first half, if you get one off. Thank you. Okay, let's see. I can go back here a little bit. Um, let's see, should be on screen to share. Huh. Um, can you see these now? Can you see those? Hopefully you can. I can't tell if people can. Tell you what, I'm it's gonna loading. go back. It it's is loading, up. okay. Okay, okay. it's up, good. <laughs> Great, so um, skip a little bit of the, the Virion stuff. Um, viruses are everywhere. Um, these other previous ones were not too critical. Um, so viruses are everywhere. Um, this is where I was gonna have a poll. Um, hopefully everybody knows what this picture is, particularly in a Mesa group. Um, this is, if you take a telescope, in fact, the Hubble Space Telescope, and look up in the sky, what you see are a ridiculous numbers of stars. In fact, most of these are galaxies. However, if you now take a microscope and look at a sample of seawater, you see something that looks like this. Now here we have, my pointer is gonna work here, um, lots of dots. And this is in fact a sample of seawater where what we've done is we've taken a nucleic acid stain. Remember nucleic acid, that's that genome, that's the instruction manual for the virus. And we also, all, all of us use DNA as well as our genetic material. And we just stained this seawater. And what we see in this very small amount of seawater is we've got some big dots. These big dots actually represent the bacteria and archaea, which are in this seawater sample. There's this thing that here kind of looks a bit like a galaxy. That's actually a diatom over here on the lower left. And all these little dots here represent virions. So these are those extracellular virus particles. So there's a heck of a lot of them here. So now can we start our next poll? Poll has begun. Thank you.
Great. So most of you got that one. I'm, I'm quite impressed. Um, so if we now look at the absolute numbers of those little particles, again, these are the virions, they're between a million and 10 million per milliliter in ocean surface waters. And that's how you get this number of 10 to the 31. Um, it's an absolutely astronomical number of viruses. And just as an example here, one of my colleagues, the late Roger Hendricks, came up with this idea where if you look at the Earth with 10 to the 31 bacterial viruses on it, it's this size, i.e. the normal Earth. And then J.B.S. Haldane, a famous evolutionary biologist, said the creator must have had an inordinate fondness for beetles. Well, if the Earth had 10 to the 31 beetles on it, it would be this size. So clearly, the creator must have had an inordinate fondness for viruses and virions. And if you were to take 10 to the 31 of these virus particles, virions, line them up end to end, they actually end up being 2 times 10 to the 7 light years long. So way longer than the whole Milky Way galaxy. Of course, they're not lined up like this. So they're all crushed together in a very different way. But still, absolutely ridiculous numbers. Um, but one thing that's even so amazing, you can see the consequence of virus infections literally from space. Here is an example of a bloom of an algae, um, and this is a particular algae called Emil Emiliana huxleyi, off of the coast of Cornwall in England. All of these cells have died because of virus infections. As you can literally see these virus infections as they are happening from space. About 50% of microbes actually die because of these kinds of viral infections. But it's not just that we have viruses in the oceans. Actually, viruses are present inside almost all cellular organisms because they've actually integrated into our genomes. This is an image of the human genome. And basically, what you can see here is that there are about 8% of the human genome is clearly viral in origin. If you think about some of the other parts of the human genome, again, that's what makes up us, it's our instruction manual, up to about 40% of the human genome is these viral dependent kinds of things. And if you look at the amount of protein coding genes in our genome, what makes humans humans, it's only about 1.5%. So we're more viral than we are human from the point of view of our genomes. And not surprisingly, even in those genes that are the genes that make us human, it turns out that there are genes that are derived from viruses that are absolutely critical for all kinds of different things, including the development of the placenta. There's a viral gene called syncytion, and if people are interested, we can talk more about it in the Q&A. Um, this clearly come from viruses. And so the development of the placenta came from a viral infection in the ancestor of all placental mammals. But even though it's just you know, what we see in our genome, which is really good for us, it turns out that virologists have learned a lot about how to use different viruses. So pretty much all gene therapy, which is going on right now, and actually a lot of what's being used to try and develop viruses against SARS-CoV-2, the causative agent of COVID-19, a lot of these mechanisms to create vaccines are very similar to what's being used in gene therapy trials. So a lot of the vaccines are also based on viruses. So viruses are incredibly useful. They also infect everything. Um, this here is an example of all of the cellular life forms based on ribosomal RNA sequences. It's a way to compare all different kinds of organisms. Um, we sit down here on this twig, um, but there's all kinds of different organisms that are really diverse relative to each other. All get infected by viruses. These are some of the virions from some of those viruses. They've got interesting shapes. This is the myxoma virus, looks a lot like the smallpox virus. This is one that was the very first discovered virus, tobacco mosaic virus the polio virus. All of you have seen images of the virion of SARS-CoV-2. And then we get to some of the work that we do in my research group. 
And that's um, in, as I mentioned at the beginning, places like Devil's Kitchen, Bumpus Hill. This particularly is a hot spring in Lassen Volcanic National Park where we go and look for viruses. Now, these are not viruses that are infecting people. These are viruses that are infecting the microbes that are present in these hot springs. Now, it turns out that these viruses don't have virions that don't look like any other virions people have seen before. And so this is the particular one that we've been working on in our research group now for over 20 years, um, which has the form that's kind of like a lemon or a lime, I guess, with these color scheme. Um, this doesn't look like any of those other virions. So we're very interested in what is it about this structure? And I actually have a 3D printed version of this particular virion here as well. What is it about that structure that allows it to survive under these really extreme environments? And the short answer is we don't know, but we've been working on the structure together with Mark Murray at the UT Medical Branch in Galveston, Texas, who has some really cool microscopes, so that he can actually look at this and understand the structure. So where do you find these neat environments? Um, hopefully some of you saw in the video at the very beginning, um, me at the side of a lake collecting some samples. Well, this is also in Lassen Volcanic National Park, which is our favorite hunting ground. It's a place called Boiling Springs Lake. And I like to think about this as sort of the biggest hot spring in the world that nobody has ever heard of. Um, it's a little hard to tell, but the very back side here, there are actually a couple of people uh, next to the lake. So that gives you an idea of how big this lake is. The lowest temperature here of this lake is 50 degrees Celsius, and the high temperature is 95 degrees, and it's got a pH of two. It's actually loaded with bacteria and archaea. There are a few eukarya, and of course, we were interested in the viruses. So we took a slightly different approach to finding these viruses there than what most people do. We use a process called virus metagenomics, which is where we collect first the virions, then from those virions, we collect their genetic material, DNA or RNA. We amplify it because it turns out that those amounts of DNA and RNA are really usually not enough to actually determine the sequence. Then after this amplification, we fragment and sequence these put these pieces together, what's called an assembly process, and then we compare what we found to known virus genomes. Now these red arrows here, this indicates the hard parts. It's getting enough virions to get the DNA and RNA, and then figuring out what they're similar to. So in order to get that material, um, you need students. Uh, these are two graduate students who were in my lab, and the work I'm gonna talk about for the next couple of minutes is mostly done by this fellow here on the left, Jeff Diemer. Um, a lot of that virus structural work was actually done by Eric Iverson, um, who is here on the right. So we collected these samples, we got their genomes, their instruction codes, and looked at them. And when we looked at them, we found all kinds of interesting things, but one in particular that was just really, really bizarre. And that was, even though we had been sequencing DNA, our sequences turned out to be similar to RNA virus sequences. And what I didn't tell you when I went through that virus introduction at the beginning is there are really sort of two different kinds of viruses. There are those viruses that use DNA for their genetic material and in their instruction manual, and those viruses that use RNA for their instruction manual. Um, the coronaviruses, by the way, use RNA as their instruction manual. But we tried to find RNA in this Boiling Springs Lake. We didn't find any. But then when we looked at the sequences, we found sequences that looked a lot like RNA viruses. So this was basically really, really bizarre. So this is that small, um, what well, we said, SSRNA viruses, sequence that looked like that. Now, to make a long story short, and this is mostly Jeff Diemer's PhD thesis, what he figured out is actually we had isolated this genome sequence, the instruction manual, for what was a DNA virus but it looked like it had actually stolen a gene from a RNA virus. How that happened, we really don't know, and that's actually a very active area of research in our research group, um, many of it being done by uh, Spanish postdoc here, Nacho de la Higuera, um, and he came up with this really nice image. Basically, what we think has happened is there was a single-stranded DNA virus and a single-stranded RNA virus 
that somehow got together, and this is a really big question mark now, and ended up generating what we now are calling cruciviruses or these crossover viruses. Originally, we called them chimeric viruses because it did look as if there was some kind of weird combination of RNA and DNA, almost as weird as the lion with the tail of a snake and the goat's head coming out of its back. This is the research group that has done a lot of this, again, down in Lassen Volcanic National Park. Um, you can see this big container here where we're collecting these large samples. Um, in terms of people who've done some of the work here, particularly it's been David Goodman, who again was a graduate student in my lab. Um, he worked on some new viruses that we discovered um, in Lassen Volcanic National Park that look like these lemon-shaped viruses. This Crucivirus project, Nacho and George Kaysen, um, together with some wonderful undergraduate students, um, Ellis Torrance, Sarah Protzek. Um, and then we also have had some high school students. Um, this is one of the high school students who was working in my lab on this particular project. Now, I'm sure all of you came to this particular talk because you were most interested in the viruses that I work on. But of course, there's another virus out there that all of us are concerned about and why we're actually not having these MESA meetings in person. And I'm not an expert on this virus, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have that I can answer, and I will be very happy to tell you that I don't know the answer to questions um, at any particular time. So with that, um, I'll actually show you the crew from last summer, um, again, including a couple of high school students um, here and here, more high school students who are in my lab, actually another high school student over here, Anna, Corinna, and Alyssa, um, and here, Lassen Peak, um, the very back here. So with that, um, I will stop sharing. And now maybe we can move over to questions. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Uh, so there are many questions coming in and just a reminder to everyone who's participating, enter questions, upvote questions. That's how we know which ones are most interesting to you. Uh, I'm going to actually just upvote my own selfish question because you mentioned you have some high school students who help with your research. And I know that there are lots of middle school and high school students who are watching today. So how do how could somebody who's a high school student watching you right now, how could they become involved in your research? So all of the high school students that I've had working with me have gone through the Apprenticeships in Science and Engineering program, Sue Saturday Academy. So I highly recommend that program. Um, we also, um, unfortunately, I can only have one or two in my lab at any given time. Yeah, I pointed out in that last picture, you know, bunch of high school students. They're actually from various different years who had all come with us down to Lassen Volcanic National Park at one time. So I usually only have one or two students with me at any given time. Um, that being said, um, one of the things that I do is I'll often do meet a scientist at OMSI. So at the very least, um, when OMSI opens back up, which I'm sure it will do, hopefully in the near future, <laughs> um, then we can also talk a little bit about viruses there. Um, I do also just recommend going to places like Yellowstone National Park, Lassen Volcanic National Park, um, and just observing some of these um, places. Um, I also have, if people are interested in more information, not so much working specifically with us, um, on my website that I mentioned at the beginning, and I also um, if people are interested in more details on viruses, I kind of covered a lot of information in a very short period of time. Um, all of my lectures from my virology course are actually on my YouTube channel as well, if people are interested. Awesome. Yeah, citizen science. <laughs> uh, so Tamara's uh, giving us, Tamara is giving us some of the most upvoted questions. And since you just mentioned some of the national parks, let's talk more about extreme environments. Uh, what is the most extreme environment that viruses have been found in? Do you think they can exist in space or some form of viruses could exist in space? Uh, so either somebody has been very careful about following my Twitter feed <laughs> or reading some of my papers um, because I've actually literally published on viruses in space. Now, this is all theoretical. We have not found any viruses in space so far, but one of our main funders is in fact NASA because they are interested in trying to find viruses in a space environment. 
Now, it's highly unlikely you're going to find any viruses, and particularly virions, again, the extracellular part of viruses, floating around in space, or even for that matter, on a meteorite. Um, what's much more likely is that if there is cellular life somewhere else, say in the oceans under the ice on Europa, like it was in that in the, the trailer video we were looking at there, if there's cellular life on Europa, I'm 99% sure, which is about as sure as a scientist can ever be, <laughs> that there are going to be viruses associated with those microbes, um, the life which is there on Europa. Now, if there's not viruses that are there, that would actually be really cool, be a great discovery, because all of life as we know it on Earth has viruses associated with it. So that gets back to sort of the first question. Now, what's the most extreme environment that we have found viruses in on Earth? Me personally and our research group, um, we go to these hot springs that are about 80 or 90 degrees Celsius, so pushing 200 degrees Fahrenheit and pHs of around two. So that's pretty extreme, but it kind of depends on what your definition of, extre of extreme is. Some people have found viruses in clouds, so extremely high altitude. Some people have found viruses in microbes that live in saturating salt conditions. Basically, you can take, literally, so one of my colleagues who works in Finland has gone throughout the world to various different salterns, solar salterns, where people dry out the salt, um, and taken salt samples, and then found viruses in them. So basically, a saturating salt solution, you find viruses in them. Um, deep sea hydrothermal vents. If you go and find the microbes there, you'll find viruses associated with the microbes. Basically, anywhere on Earth where there is life, you will find viruses associated with it. Now, we haven't found life off of Earth, so we can't say if there are any viruses that are associated with them. But again, it would surprise me if there wasn't. Again, just because here, everywhere on Earth, all life has viruses associated with it. So if there's life somewhere else that doesn't have viruses associated with it, that actually would be potentially really, really interesting. But I'm guessing there probably will be. Yeah, I will be fascinated when we get that information. That'll be exciting. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. Um, oh, this is a question that I think got upvoted pretty highly right away, uh, right as soon as things started. Are viruses alive? Ah, now somebody's going to try and put me on the spot on this one. Um, viruses, now, if you remember what I talked about right at the beginning, sort of, you know, with, you got the virion that gets into a cell and then reprograms that cell to make more virions. That to me is a lot like a life cycle. Um, but if you think about the virion itself, that extracellular particle, again, I'll pull up my, my little you know, model here. Um, is this alive? Is a seed alive? Is a spore alive? I think it really depends on sort of the context that you're thinking about. So most people would say a virion is not alive, and I would, I would agree with that. But if you think about the process of replication, that does kind of fit into most life definitions. So, but I usually don't answer the question. I obfuscate and sort of avoid it and say, viruses are part of life as we know it. Awesome. Way to answer, not answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> I've been uh, practicing that one for a while. <laughs> so we have a lot of students here who have had various classes and levels of biology and science. And uh, you mentioned DNA and RNA. Can you explain a little bit what the difference is between those two? Yeah. So uh, a real quick shout out for my buddy, Crazy Aunt Lindsay. I don't know if you know Crazy Aunt Lindsay, Ebeth. So <laughs> she's awesome. Um, and I was on one of her digital daycares a um, couple of weeks back now, where we actually I had Lego models for DNA and RNA. So um, that's one way to check out you know, the differences between DNA and RNA at a very basic Lego-ish level. Um, but at more of a high school level, um, difference between DNA and RNA, well, it's one letter, right? <laughs> but it's deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid. Um, and that has to do with how the the actual genetic information is fit together. Um, there are these polymers, everyone knows the double helix, you know, their DNA sort of wrapped around itself. Well, on the back part of that DNA, that is actually made of deoxyribose, 
And then in RNA, there's a change, and actually all this is just an OH instead of an H in the molecule, which makes that RNA versus DNA. So it's ribonucleic acid versus deoxyribonucleic acid. So you know that tiny little change sounds like it shouldn't make a big difference, but it turns out it does actually make a really big difference because the chemistry that you have with an OH versus an H is completely different. And so RNA can actually work as a catalyst, um, kind of like some proteins. And so a lot of scientists, myself included, think that probably the very origin of a life on Earth used RNA as its genetic material, but also used RNA for its catalysis and doing its chemistry, which actually sort of made it life. And so people talk about that sort of what they call an RNA world that predated DNA being used as the genetic material and predated proteins being used as the machinery for putting stuff together. So basically, the RNA was the machinery and the information. So machinery and information just in one molecule, which is, is really fascinating. But we know now that RNA can do that. RNA can be a machinery and it can encode information. Um, the other thing about RNA, and which is probably why we actually use DNA now for our genetic material, is RNA is actually a lot less stable um, because of that OH that does undergo chemical reactions. Um, what it means is as soon as you start to get a really long stretch of information, like you have in an RNA genome, um, that starts to fall apart. And so if you think about um, RNA being used as genetic material or DNA being used as genetic material, um, our DNA in each of our cells is about 6 billion of these individual nucleotides long. The largest RNA genome, which interestingly enough is coronaviruses, <laughs> is about 30,000. So 30,000 to 6 billion. Um, so that tells you something a little bit about the stability as well. Um, but that's the, the actual, the real difference is that OH. And then turns out there's actually one different piece of information. And so DNA uses four letters for its information, C, A, T, and G. RNA uses C, U, G, um, and uh, A. So one different letter. Awesome. Uh, and just to clarify for other folks who maybe haven't taken chemistry yet, when you say H versus OH group, that's a hydrogen atom versus an oxygen and a hydrogen group, correct? That is correct, yes. Awesome. Uh, cool. So I have a question wondering, how did you get into this field? How did you get into studying viruses and what schooling did you have to do to get where you are today? So that's a great question. Um, and I think the answer, the short answer is indirectly. Um, I came into this, uh, my undergraduate degree is in chemical engineering. Let me back it even further. Um, in high school, I really liked biology. I also really liked chemistry. And um, I was pretty good in math. And so I thought, hmm, well, I could, I could do you know, a combination of some of these things. I'll go into chemical engineering. And I thought, oh, this is a really you know, cool program. I'll learn a bunch. I did. I learned a lot in chemical engineering. But then at the end of my undergraduate career, I said, eh. I'm actually not really that excited about what chemical engineers do. And I was really fortunate between my junior and senior years in college to get an internship working at what was then a small biotech company, Genentech, which of course is now a much bigger biotech company. Um, and in that process, I learned about these proteins and you know, really the molecular biology of things, which I hadn't thought about at all. But my biology course as a high school student was dissecting cats, which was totally cool, but <laughs> we didn't really get into the molecular aspects of things. So between my junior and senior years in college, I learned about these molecular things through this internship. And then through that internship, I ended up actually getting a job in Switzerland, um, working at a big biotech company, oh, actually really a big pharmaceutical company. Uh, and then after a couple of years there, uh, doing sort of a combination of chemical engineering and biology and biotechnology. Then I decided if I want to get any further, I need to get an advanced degree. And I ended up getting accepted into two different PhD programs. One was molecular and cell biology. The other one was biochemical engineering. And I actually ended up making my decision mostly based on where I wanted to live rather than the actual program. Um, so I got my degree in molecular and cell biology. And then as part of that program, 
I was teaching. And it's a cliche, you know, there's there's no better way to, excuse me, no better way to learn something than to try and teach it. Um, so I highly recommend to you know, any of these people out there, if you want to learn something, try and tutor your friends, your parents, your brother, your dog. Um, that's the best way to try and learn something is to try and teach somebody about it or help them learn it. It's a better way of thinking about it. And so at that point, I learned about these extreme organisms, these extreme microbes living in these hot springs. I thought, wow, that's really amazing. I'd love to learn more about them. Um, but more about them from a molecular biology point of view, not so much from a virus point of view. But the viruses are great tools for understanding how organisms they infect work. And it turns out a lot of what we know about humans. And in fact, the fact that we know that we use DNA as our genetic material actually comes from the study of viruses originally. So using viruses to study the extreme microbes is how I started to get interested in this field. And then um, I you know, found these viruses were so fascinating that I couldn't not work on them. So started out in chemical engineering, sort of went through molecular biology and pharmaceuticals, and now I'm working on viruses. And getting back to that story about, you know, the best way to learn something is to teach it. Um, I had one biology course as an undergraduate. Now I'm a professor of biology. I had zero virology courses <laughs> as an undergraduate. Even before my first ever virology course, I was standing up front. Awesome. Sounds like quite the adventure. Um, <laughs> I'm looking at time. I think we have time for one more question before we turn it back over to Josh. Um, how about... So you talked about this early on, but maybe you could reiterate a bit. Um, can you give a little bit more explanation on the difference between a virus and a virion? Oh, definitely. So the virion is one part of the virus replication cycle. It's that extracellular part. So any virus, in order to be able to make more virus, needs a cell. So it's basically the environment that the virus needs to replicate in. So I'll, I'll go back to that seed or acorn analogy. So you can think about the virion as the seed and the virus as the tree or the whole life cycle of the tree. And so virion extracellular and virus, that whole process. Awesome. Uh, that was a pretty fast answer. We still have about five minutes left. So maybe we can fit in one more question. Sure. Oh, uh, let's see. Ooh. So when you are out gathering your samples from lakes, how do you separate the virions or the viruses from uh, the other material that must be in there in the lakes? So great question. Again, um, we take advantage of the fact that most virions are smaller than most cells. Now, there are examples where that's not true, but it's always exceptions, it's biology. Um, but literally what we do is we take the small stuff, we take what we find, we filter it through a filter with really small holes, and this is how viruses were discovered in the very beginning, is that people took samples, they filtered them through very, very small holes that bacteria couldn't get through, and they saw that what came through could cause disease. And so that's basically exactly the same thing as we do. We take a big sample of water from that boiling springs lake, we run it through a filter, and then we take what comes out the other side. Awesome. Fancy filters. Yeah, they right. are pretty fancy filters. <laughs> Uh, with that, thank you so much for sharing all that information about viruses. It was really fascinating. I know uh, my favorite parts were the comparison of the galaxies image to the seawater drop. I really like that macro and micro scale comparison. And I thought the uh, picture of Earth with viruses versus Earth with 10 to the 31 beetles was also really, really delightful. Uh, so now I'm going to turn it back over to Josh. Thank you so much, Ebeth, and thank you, Dr. Sedman. That was a, a really interesting presentation. I, I appreciate it. That concludes our OMSI STEM Spark session. Uh, sorry, our OMSI STEM Spark session for the day.
Uh, students, we really appreciate all of you joining today. Uh, please do stick around to fill out a survey so we can learn more about your experience. Uh, and keep in mind that they, uh, students who fill out that survey will be entered to win a, uh, a game. <laughs> Sorry, we'll be entered to win a Smart Circuits Games and Gadgets Electronics Lab. We're going to be announcing the winners of our session on Thursday during the end of week ceremony. Uh, we'll begin our last session of the day in Inventor Spotlight with Dr. Rose Ariaga at 4.15 p.m. And we hope to see you there. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.